Okay. Uh, yeah, sorry. Just <clears throat> yeah, hi. So, greetings. Last week, I had a conversation with God Logic and his, uh, his team. And we ended up discussing a passage in Isaiah 48, 16. And God Logic explains that because he believes Jehovah is speaking in the preceding verses in Isaiah 48, he therefore and therefore continues to speak in Isaiah 48, 16, that because the speaker is Jehovah, and he declares that the Lord Jehovah has sent me and his spirit, sorry, the Lord Jehovah has sent him and his spirit, that this must mean there are two Jehovahs in this passage. God logic then claims that because one Jehovah sent his spirit, then the spirit is also a distinct person, and therefore we have the Trinity. As such, we can abandon the common Trinitarian claim that the Jews believe in two powers in heaven, because actually they believed in three. What is it, God logic? Two powers or three? So, not surprising, the Trinitarian interpretation of this passage is beset with grammatical, textual and interpretational issues that render such an interpretation meaningless. Moreover, if God's logic's claims were true and Isaiah 48, 16 does teach the Trinity, this is the Holy Grail verse of the Bible. It would be the go-to verse for all Trinitarians who have two Jehovahs and his spirit as a distinct person. One wonders, therefore, why the church was beset over hundreds of years of conflicting, evolving creedal statements that had to be enforced through the power of the sword to determine who God Almighty was and who his anointed human servant was, when actually all along Isaiah 48.16 tells us who the Trinity is. Well, let's test God Logic's claims. First, the first claim in Isaiah 48.16 that a second Jehovah is speaking. What do we know about this? There's an insurmountable textual problem, sorry, grammatical problem, and it's this. In the earliest Greek and Hebrew manuscripts we have of this passage, which we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls and Codex Sciaticus and Vaticanus, is that there are no punctuation marks. Newsflash, without punctuation marks, you can't determine who is speaking in verse 16. Therefore, you have no argument. Now, believe it or not, Sam Shimon, who is God Logic's mentor, agrees with me. He is on record saying that he does not use Isaiah 48:16 to prove the Trinity. Why? Because he cannot prove Jehovah God is speaking. And you can go online and you can check that out for yourself. So what? What do we know about this passage in Isaiah and the book of Isaiah in general? We know that sometimes the prophet speaks in the first person. We then know the prophet records Jehovah God speaking in the first person. In chapter 48, verse 1 and 2, not even the most ardent Trinitarian would be foolish enough to say it's God Almighty speaking. Rather, they know it's Isaiah speaking. Then, Isaiah records Jehovah speaking in the first person from verse 3 down to verse 15. Then, all modern scholarship, he almost universally agrees, that Isaiah returns back to speaking in the first person and that therefore it is Isaiah speaking in verse 16, not a second Jehovah, yeah, which cannot be proven because there's no grammar or speech marks to say this, and that is Isaiah saying that Jehovah God has sent him and his spirit. So, and if we look at the context of this passage, within the historical contents of Isaiah, it's clear that it is a message for the people of that day. It is a prophecy concerning the capture of Babylon by Cyrus. And in verse 20, we have Isaiah telling the Israelites to flee from Babylon. There's a practical element to this. Isaiah was given a prophetic message to share. Now, secondly, this passage is never attributed to or claimed to be speaking of Yeshua in the New Testament. So on what grounds does God logic make such an assertion? We can't isolate single random passages from the Hebrew Bible and then claim they're speaking about Yeshua without the authority of the New Testament. Because the New Testament teaches us that after the resurrection of Jesus, he spent 40 days teaching his disciples what specific passages in the Hebrew Bible were about him. This verse is never explicitly attributed to Jesus in the New Testament. And thirdly, this is the majority Trinitarian view that it is not God Almighty speaking, 
in Isaiah 48, 16. Thus, our start point has got to be, we acknowledge these words were spoken by the proper Isaiah in the first instance. He was the one Jehovah sent to proclaim the message. He proclaimed it with the authority of and under the direction of the Spirit of Almighty God. Sadly, God logic has demonstrated an abject failure to apply any logic in arguing there are two Jehovah's presented in this passage. Thus, he has failed at the first hurdle. Secondly, we're going to look at the second claim, that because the Spirit is sent, that somehow, all of a sudden, a Holy Spirit person has manifested in the Hebrew Bible. Now, in order to look at this, we need to set a sure foundation, and I'm going to explore and go through how the term Holy Spirit, or Spirit of God, is used in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. So starting with the Hebrew Bible, we have approximately 125 occasions where scripture talks about the Spirit of Jehovah, or the Spirit of the God, or we have Jehovah speaking in the first person, saying, my Spirit, okay? Now finally, we have three occasions where in the Hebrew, it talks about the Spirit of His Holiness talking of Jehovah God's Spirit. Now, in the English, these three phrases are translated as Holy Spirit. Jehovah declares that he has, or he will, pour out his Spirit. He will place his Spirit. He will put his Spirit upon his apostles and his anointed ones. Yet we see no Jewish prophet or writer ever argue or think or write that this is referring to a distinct Holy Spirit person. It talks about the Spirit being the possessive of God Almighty. We're also told the Spirit of Jehovah took possession of Gideon, took up, came upon the prophet, rushed upon Samson, rested upon the uh, uh, Yeshua, has lifted up uh, a prophet. In every single passage, the scripture declares the Spirit is God's and it is not a distinct person. And this shouldn't surprise us. As 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 16 teaches us, the Spirit of God is inseparable from the person of God. Just as if, sorry, just as the spirit of a man is inseparable from a man. I'm just gonna say that again. This is the universal cry of the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament. Just as the spirit of the God is inseparable from the person of God, so the spirit of a man, so your spirit is inseparable from the person of you. So, if we now turn to the New Testament, we find something really peculiar. We find the spirit of the God, or the spirit of God used approximately 20 times. We see that the, the title, the spirit of the Lord, so a replacement for the spirit of Jehovah, used approximately four times. On three occasions, the God is recorded speaking in the first person saying, my spirit. And on five more occasions, the Spirit is identified as the Father's Spirit or God's Spirit. But this is the anomaly. For some reason, we see the phrase Holy Spirit a whopping 94 times. That phrase isn't even, well, if used, it's only used three times in the Hebrew Bible. So potentially this provides the origin of some of the confusion we have when trying to understand the Holy Spirit because the language from the Hebrew Bible has subtly changed. But I don't think we need to worry because Yeshua teaches us our Holy God and Father is Holy Spirit. God Almighty is who he is. He is the one true God. Spirit is what he is. I'll say this again. Our God and Father is holy, yeah? God Almighty is who he is, the one true God. Spirit is what he is. And because Jehovah God is spirit, he can pour out, he can send, he can place his spirit on the prophets and his anointed ones, on you and I. He can even give authority for Jesus to place it on others in a way in which we cannot understand. We don't have to understand it in its fullness. We just need to trust what scripture says and not go beyond what is written in scripture. So the Holy Spirit is the third person. Our holy God, the Father, is spirit. And the Bible makes it perfectly clear that the Spirit is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit isn't someone else, but the Father's own Spirit, which is why we call this Spirit His Spirit, and why He calls the Spirit My Spirit. So, and why do I say this? Because in the New Testament, 
the titles of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of the God, Spirit of the Living God, Spirit of our God, the Spirit of the God of us, the Holy Spirit of God, the Spirit of the Father, the Glorious Spirit of the God, my Spirit, Spirit of the Lord are all interchangeable with the title or phrase the Holy Spirit in the book of Matthew, John, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, 1 Peter and 1 John. So what? Our starting point for assessing God logic's claim that because in Isaiah 48, 16, that Jehovah sends his spirit with this human prophet, that this is somehow talking about a distinct Holy Spirit person must be rejected out of hand because there is no evidence anywhere in the Hebrew Bible or in the New Testament that Jehovah's Spirit is a person distinct from him. We're now just gonna to go to the passage in detail. For interest, some of you might be interested to know that the earliest record we have of this passage is from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we've got three witnesses. So these dates are around 250 AD, 500 years earlier than the earliest Greek version of this text. And the Dead Sea Scrolls read this. The Lord Jehovah sent me with his spirit, not and his spirit. I'll read back. The earliest record we have of Isaiah 48, 16. Three witnesses in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Jehovah, the Lord Jehovah has sent me with his spirit. And doesn't that make sense, ladies and gentlemen? We have three witnesses in the book of Isaiah that Jehovah God would raise up a human, spirit, a human prophet on whom he would place his spirit upon, who would pour his spirit upon, that the spirit of Jehovah would rest upon that individual. We're gonna go look at them very quickly in a second. Now, even if the Greek statement is authentic and it says, the Lord Jehovah sent me with his spirit, does that mean the Holy Spirit has now manifested himself as, a, as an individual person? Of course not. Look, in the, uh, in the Hebrew, the verb has sent in Isaiah 48, 16 is in singular form, which indicates the term Jehovah, the Lord God, and his spirit are not describing two separate divine beings or persons. The word spirit is simply a biblical term for indicating God in action. He is doing something, such as sending someone, and in this case, the prophet Isaiah, accompanied with his spirit. Or put another way, his spirit is not a second subject along with Jehovah, but a second object. Both the one human being being sent and the spirit are Jehovah's. Thus, modern scholarship almost universally agrees, and these are Trinitarians, not Unitarians, that the person speaking here is Isaiah, in the first person, talking about being sent on a prophetic mission by the one true God, being empowered and equipped with the spirit of the one true God. And if you just read the preceding verse in Isaiah 48, 16, this is crystal clear. We don't even need to go to grammar. We don't even need to go to earlier manuscripts. Let's listen to what Jehovah God says in Isaiah 48, 16. Here, he explicitly defines himself as a single person, a single one, a myself, and then he sends, then he declares he sent only one person, not two persons. Look, Isaiah 48 reads, I myself, I have spoken. First person singular pronouns, yeah? Indeed, I have called him. Jehovah doesn't say I have called them. God logic is arguing in verse 48, 16 that there are two distinct persons in view. A second Yahweh, which is Jesus, and a, a third divine figure, which is the Spirit. What does Jehovah God say in Isaiah 15? I myself have sent him. Jehovah is sending one person, the prophet. And just ask yourselves, when you read Jehovah God saying, myself, how many selves are there in the phrase myself? Come on guys and girls. And what's really important to understand is that Jehovah is a singular noun. Yeah, I'm gonna say that again. Jehovah is a singular noun. Look, the Hebrew Bible tells us, it's replete with examples that the Spirit of God is at his disposal to, to bestow upon anyone he chooses. And we've already talked about how that God sent out his spirit, he poured out his spirit, he placed his spirit upon people. And there's no understanding that this is referring to an independent spirit person. And, you know, 
If we are truly to believe that the Holy Spirit is this third person, independent, co-equal, co-eternal member of the triune Godhead, why is he always ordered about? Why is he always told what to do? Why doesn't he have a name? Why has he missed out of key greetings? Why is he never prayed to? Why is he never worshipped? Why doesn't he have a throne to sit on? Even the 24 elders in the book of Revelation have a throne, but not the poor old Holy Spirit. Is he going to rule the future kingdom of God? No, of course not. Look, even God, when speaking to Moses, talks about taking the spirit from Moses, applying it to the 70 elders. And then God took some of the spirit of Moses and gave it to the prophet Joshua. How can the Holy Spirit be a distinct person? This is just fantastical nonsense. The term Spirit of God is simply talking about the power of God in Scripture and it's the characteristics that define Him as a true and living God and that He is present in the world. Now, we're going to come to the nub of the matter. and This is the really important part that I want everyone to really focus on. We're looking at a passage in Isaiah. God logic is stating that the phrase there, and His Spirit, is referring to a second Holy Spirit person and a second Jehovah. Okay, but what does the book of Isaiah say about a, this human servant that God Almighty is going to raise up? We've got three witnesses in Isaiah 11, Isaiah 42, and Isaiah 61 that Jehovah God is going to raise up a human prophet upon whom he will place his spirit. So just really quickly, Isaiah 11 says, A shoot will come out from the stump of Jesse, a branch from its roots will bear fruit, and the spirit of Jehovah will rest on him. Isaiah 42 one and two says, look, here is my servant, my chosen one, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit on him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. And then finally, Isaiah 61, one to two, you see Isaiah seeing Jesus speaking in the first person, saying the spirit of the Lord Jehovah, or the spirit of Jehovah is upon me, for he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Now we can all agree that the New Testament explicitly tells us in those three passages it is Jesus speaking. In Luke 4, Jesus reads from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah that is in line with Isaiah 42 and Isaiah 61. At his baptism we know that the Spirit of God descended upon Yeshua and in Acts chapter 10 you know Peter says it was common knowledge look and you read verses 38 and 37 sorry 37 38 common knowledge how the God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. Not with that Holy Spirit person and power. Common knowledge, Peter says. Common knowledge that the God, the self-existent one, Jehovah anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit and power. And then in Revelation, in three occasions, chapters 3, chapters 5, and chapters 22, we are told by Jesus himself in the first person that he is the one spoken about in Isaiah 11 upon whom the spirit of Jehovah will rest. And he's given this spirit for the edification and building up of the church in his role as the high priest. And I'll just read one of the three versions as I'm drawing to an end. It says in Revelation 5.5, 5, And one of the elders have said to me, Do not weep. Behold, uh, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so he can open the scroll and its seven seals. <clears throat> These passages prove beyond doubt that the language of Jehovah sending his spirit in Isaiah 48.16 is not talking about a distinct Holy Spirit person. We have got to submit to the hundreds of statements that refer to the Spirit of God as his own possession. Jehovah God is spirit. He is not flesh. The Spirit is His active power and presence in the world. We can't fully comprehend it. We don't have to, we just need to trust it. So, the last statement I'm going to use, I'm just going to address very quickly now, is the slight butchering of John 15, 26, because this is kind of where God Logic and his buddies retreated to, where it talks about the Spirit proceeding from the Father. Now, the point is, is that many Bible translations don't use the word proceed, so we've got ambiguous, an ambiguous translation of a Greek word, yeah? Actually, the, the full definition is to make, to go forth, or to go forth. And I would argue that the most honest translation of that verse is this. And I've got it from the Center for New Testament Restoration. And it reads, when the advocate or the helper comes, 
whom I will send to you from the Father, this is Jesus speaking, the Spirit of truth, who I will be sending, literally, who I will send from the Father, this one will testify to me. You see, if we get rid of this word proceed from, we can get rid of all this philosophical, pagan nonsense that somehow if the Spirit proceeds from the Father, that the Spirit is a distinct Holy Spirit person. When does Jesus ever talk about this, guys? Look, the Nicene Creed is clear. It only mentions the Holy Spirit in three sentences and the Holy Spirit. We are told that at the Council of Constantinople that the bishops there added the Philique, a more eloquent statement recognizing the Holy Spirit proceedeth from the Father and is worshipped along with the Father and the Son. And that happened in 381 AD. But there's a problem, ladies and gentlemen, which very few people will tell you, is that we have no historical evidence for this addition to the Nicene Creed ever occurring at the Council of Constantinople. In fact, what we do know about the Council of Constantinople is that an edict was made that no church father, no church council could add to the wording of the Council of Nicaea that was in 325 AD. So it would be very strange if the Council of Constantinople did add this more developed understanding of who the Holy Spirit was, because that would be in direct contradiction and opposition to what the council members decreed was that the Nicene Creed was inspired by the Holy Spirit and therefore cannot be added to. We then go to the Council of Ephesus in 421, and again, no mention explicitly of the Holy Spirit, but they do say no one is to add to the words of the Nicene Creed. There's no reference to the Creed of Constantinople. However, ladies and gentlemen, we then get to the nub of the matter, the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. And at the Council of Chalcedon, something extraordinary happens. And you can check what I'm saying by going to any papal website and researching this for yourself. At the Council of Chalcedon, the church members there discover by chance the so-called Constantinople Creed where all of a sudden the Holy Spirit is identified as, as something. And so they say, look, we now have the evidence, although the early church fathers said we cannot add to the Council of Nicaea, we now have authority to add to the Council of Nicaea because look, they did it back in 381 AD. The issue is, folks, there is no historical record of any church father or of the council records of Constantinople or Ephesus of this additional statement about the Holy Spirit that is touted by Trinitarian scholars of Constantinople. There's no evidence that it was ever written. No church father ever quotes it. So it's only in 450, 51 AD that we get this Constantinople Holy Spirit Creed, which then gives the church fathers there the requirement to create the Trinity where the Holy Spirit is now identified as a distinct person. Brothers and sisters, I ask you please to prayerfully and consider testing what I am saying. Yeah, Jehovah God is spirit. God Almighty is who he is. Spirit is what he is. I'd like to contest that, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Question. Yes, you may. How are you going to bring the people back to the church? And what message are you going to use other than the one you've just used now? No, no, it's fine. It's a fine question. I think how we want to unify in the worship of being obedient to the instructions of the one true God. We want to live lives, yeah, where we are, where where people can look at the way we live, and we live good and holy and righteous lives. That and so therefore they are drawn, and so by the way in which we live, our character is expressing the nature of God Almighty. So that's how. I understand that we all grow up with different religious and cultural experiences and influences and that there is a battle for our souls, both in the flesh and in the spirit. And therefore, sometimes it's difficult and we can't know all the answers and I'm presenting what I believe. I agree with what you just said. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But my, my, my disappointment is this. When Christians come to the park, they say, you're a sinner, you need to be washed with blood, you're going to hell, etc, etc, etc. Do you really believe that that's going to attract people to your church? 
No, I don't think that's the right message. I think the first message is to acknowledge... Again, I agree with what you just said. Yeah, yeah. So I believe the first message is, is that we acknowledge that we are created. We're not an accident. And that this world was created by the one true God. The creator. Yeah. Pardon, sorry? The creator. The creator. And, and he cares about how we live. And he has a message for us. And, and part of that message is, he wants us to live good and holy and kind lives. I agree. Yeah? And so, um, it's understanding what his message is, what his instructions for living are, and what his guidance is. And so, there comes a point where if someone is exposed to that and they choose to reject that, that that is where, because our Father, our God, is a just God, is that he will punish the wicked. But I agree, that's the first, and actually the early Christians, they start, they talk about acknowledging that we're created. There is one true God and he calls us all to follow, follow, to follow him. So again, what is the message that you're going to send out there, like people here today, where people are going to stand here? Yeah, yeah I'm just speaking to him, but, so I finished my I'll, bit I'll now. I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. Yeah. Read a small passage for me from your Bible. A small passage? Matthew yeah. 5, 1 to 43. Any, two or three from that passage. Yeah, that's Please, fine. if you would. I don't know your name, by the way. Uh, Josh. Josh. Yeah, yeah. Josh. Yeah, yeah, we will do in a second. I'll just answer these little questions. Oh, yeah, 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 they, they yeah, wanted yeah. to have a discussion. Well, they would do just because I'm... Uh, yeah. It always happens. Don't worry.